first and foremost, a human being made in the image of God, and probably as a Christian, you are therefore a child of God. And so you're supposed to take on the characteristics of God himself. Some of our children look like us. May the Lord help them. <laughs> because they take on the characteristics of their parents. And so what has happened in the great past of eternity is that God has determined a way to make human beings his children. He's created them in his own image, Genesis 1. And through the course of history, because humanity fell and was flawed and broken, and our image not the perfect thing God originally intended, he had to send a rescue operation. And the rescue package involved his son. God the Father sent God the Son to die on a cross and to rise from the dead to make it possible for all of humanity to become a child of God. Because as we are in Christ, and Christ's Father is God, so we also take on the fatherhood of God. He becomes our Father, and we're adopted into this heavenly family. Now that's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Who wouldn't want to be the, the son or daughter of someone famous and important? Because just imagine the access it will give you to money and power. We'd all like that. Wouldn't you like to drive through the streets of Kampala with lots of vehicles ahead of you flashing their lights and the army and police clearing the road? Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you get through the traffic much quicker than you normally do? So who wouldn't want to be the son and daughter of someone powerful and famous? So the biblical truth about God is that he has adopted us through his son. And that's a wonderful message because it means that the brokenness which sin and dirt and wrong brought into the world, the horror of rebellion against a holy God has been wiped out Amen. by Jesus dying for us on the cross, setting us free and granting us the gift of eternal life. Now that's a wonderful thing. And so we start this conference by saying to ourselves, we are adopted into the family of God through the work of Jesus Christ. So we ourselves are all adopted children, every one of us, because we're not naturally God's children. It's not until the new birth becomes a reality in our lives that we experience the fatherhood of God. So every human being who wants to be a Christian who wants to have God as his father has to be adopted. I think that's a lovely picture because when we're thinking about children, abandoned children, children from broken families, and how are we going to adopt them into safe families? How are we going to rescue them? We remind ourselves that we don't do this arrogantly from a position of uh, confidence and strength. We ourselves have been rescued. Amen. We ourselves have been adopted by God himself. So we remind ourselves right at the start that Christians are adopted into God's family. God is our father because we're in Christ who is the son of God. And then we remind ourselves that God in himself is in relationship with himself. Let us make man in our own image, Genesis says. What does that mean? It must mean that in the Trinity there is a relational being. God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so into that relational model of God, Christians come. The Father sends the Son. Now, why does this matter? Because our view of God determines the kind of people we are, and it determines our priorities for nations, for societies, for communities, for churches, for ourselves. If you are uh, a Muslim, your view of life is determined by the fact that you see God as Allah, someone other, someone largely defined by their distance from humanity. Now that's not the entire definition uh, of Allah, but it's a very significant one. In Islam, there's, there's no clear doctrine of fatherhood in the heart of God. Or what if you're a Hindu? And you have a multiplicity of gods 
In all those relationships, the concept of fatherhood is absent. Or the philosophical understanding in Buddhism of God. Not that such a concept is clear in Buddhism at all, but there's an absence of understanding of fatherhood. And so the kind of God we worship affects the kind of people we are and affects the priorities that we have. And so the Christian God, who is fundamentally a father, according to the Bible, affects the way we treat each other and the way we think of ourselves, adopted children, and the way we think of others in need who also need that adoptive grace to be drawn into the family of God. So who God is in his essence is critical to our understanding of how we behave and how we live. And that's why these first sentences are all about definition and the way God reveals himself to us and the way we understand his presence. And the Bible is not, uh, not quiet on this subject. It's not shy in telling us uh, these, uh, these things. We're going to look at the Bible in a minute. I can't actually see you very well because of the bright lights, which is fine. Um, are you still there? Yes. Okay, good. I just, just was checking that, that actually in all of this great presentation and you listening and so on, that you, you are actually there. It, it's so bright that all of you could actually leave and, and have some more coffee and I'd never know. So I'm glad that you're still, uh, I'm glad that you're still listening and that you're still uh, here. So let's look at the Bible together. If it's true what I'm saying about the nature of God, and the fact that for Christians this is fundamental to the way we operate, live, and believe, we ought to look at what the Bible says about the nature of God and the way he operates his loving kindness towards us from the Old and the New Testaments and to see that opened up before us. And so the first scripture is Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. I think you see it there in these four scriptures that are listed. If you do have a Bible, it would be enormously helpful to turn to it, to note it somewhere, because in the end, unless we understand these things and we believe it, preach it and teach it, we'll simply be pragmatists. If there's a need, we might try and meet it. But actually, there's something far more serious about this. You see, relationships fundamentally work when they are undergirded by truth not simply by necessity. Let me say that again very carefully because it, it matters. Relationships work best when they're undergirded by truth and not just by necessity. You've met my wife earlier this morning. She was leading in worship. Uh, I love my wife. Uh, I try to be kind and nice to her. Why? Uh, is it because I hope my food will improve? Is it because I, I hope that she won't quite nag me as much as she might otherwise if I'm nice to her? Is it because I want to get better treatment? Now, all of those things might be true, but they're relationship by necessity. I'm being kind for what I can get out of it. But what if the Bible says that I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church? Do you think the Bible says that? In which case... I am, my relationship is not just undergirded by necessity. I'm going to be nice to her because it just makes my life easier. Happy wife, happy life. You men know what I'm talking about. It's undergirded by truth. It's not because I get my own way if I'm nice, but because God's commanded it. So we work with children and young people, not just because we have a little soft heart, although that's good, but because in the end, it reflects the character of God. That's why we do it. So let's look at what King David wrote about the character of God. Here it is in Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. A father to the fatherless, defining God, David, in this great song of praise, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So what is God like? 
for David, writing here the Israelite hymn book. God is a father to the fatherless. And these words were written many, many years before Jesus came. It's not just a revelation that Jesus brought. In the very earliest understanding of the nature of God, King David knew that as praise to this almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful being that ruled the world, God was certainly that. He was also Father. And he was a father to those with no father. Notice how far back this message occurs in the Bible. It wasn't that Jesus invented this when he came. Long before him, the view of God was broken, abandoned people, children in many cases, were fathered by the living God. And it's exciting that those concepts are not new to the New Testament, but here they are in the songs and praise of the Old Testament. And, and then there's Exodus chapter 2, which takes us even further back in the Old Testament, right towards the beginning of the people of God, way back in time. An amazing God who wants that to happen. So this story, right at the beginning of the Israelite narrative, reminds us of God's compassion for an abandoned child. And then Esther chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Let's have a look at this, uh, uh, this, uh, this passage. If you, can, uh, if you can flick through and find it in your... Uh, uh, in your Bibles. Isn't it funny, when you're really looking for a verse to find it quickly, uh, it disappears from your Bible. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you're trying to find it quickly in the pulpit and then it's as if God's removed the book you're looking for from the Bible. Esther, chapter 2. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. That's how to find it. Verses 5 to 7. This is about um, uh, a man called Mordecai. Quite a significant leader among God's people. Verse 6, who had been carried into exile by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, then a bunch of names you don't need to worry about. Verse 7 then says, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he'd brought up because she had neither father nor mother. The girl who was also known as Esther was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. How interesting is this? That in the middle of this great Persian empire, the great expansion of, of an empire that was pretty brutal and cruel, we're about to discover a woman who's going to be raised up to protect God's people. What kind of person is Esther? She's an orphan. She's been abandoned by her parents. I don't mean they deliberately abandoned her, but they passed away. And so raised by her uncle. And so here, even in the heart of a cruel empire, the other side of the world from Jerusalem, well, four or five hundred miles away, is a story of an orphan child, a little girl, embraced by God and raised up to change a nation. Do you know, this is a wonderful story, isn't it? Because that means that a child we pluck from the street, an abandoned child whose parents have died of HIV or AIDS, and maybe parents or grandparents killed in uh, warfare, those children whose society views as next to nothing can be raised up and become next generation leaders. Amen. That can happen. Why? Because of Esther, who was nothing. And God, in his wisdom, includes this story to remind us of the beautiful, restorative, recovering work that he does. Because that's the kind of God he is. He goes on fathering abandoned people and making their lives changed and different. And then into the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Just to remind you that this is not just God's activity among the Old Testament Jews. But it's also God's divine activity among the New Testament believers, indeed, the New Testament church. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Paul uh, writes this book. Uh, and don't forget, just before we read the verse, 
Who's this book addressed to? The Romans. Where do the Romans live? Rome. <laughs> How important a city is Rome? Very. <laughs> it's the heart of the Roman Empire. It is the capital city. Where are we now situated? In the capital city of Uganda. And so this is a letter addressed to people living in a capital city. A letter encouraging a small church surrounded by lots of people in the ancient Roman Empire who wanted nothing to do with Christianity. Many of them had never heard of it. And into that melting pot of many races and nationalities in Rome and that oppressive dictatorship which the Roman Empire was, an enormous military power, the small church begins to flourish. And Paul writes to teach them theology and to encourage them how to live. And this church in a strategic location hears this word. My brothers and sisters, we're in Kampala. If you want to change Uganda, you have to change Kampala. It's, it has to be done. Because this is where the economic and the military and the political power resides. And so this letter is particularly pertinent to us today as we explore this vast and significant theme. And so Romans 8 verse 23 says this. Not only so, that is all of creation's groaning, waiting for God to, to rescue it, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning we're Christian followers, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so my presentation comes to an end where it began, full circle talking again about the adoption we're waiting for as sons. So here's the thing. Are we adopted or are we waiting to be adopted? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we're both of those. We're adopted in Christ, but we don't have it all yet. We're waiting for that final moment of adoption. In some cultures, a child can't inherit wealth until they reach the age of majority or adulthood. That's often 18, sometimes it's 21. At that point, they're always adopted, but at that point, they enter into the fullness of the inheritance of the adoption. And so our God has not just adopted us in Christ, with all the blessings that the Holy Spirit gives to us, but he is saving up the best for his children till last. And so, through the gateway of death itself, adopted children like us, who are followers of Jesus, are going to enter into all the riches of eternity and enjoy it. You and I are going to be perfect in eternity. I think that's very good news. I, I think my wife's quite pleased I'm going to be perfect in eternity. Because I'm not yet. So we're going to be adopted as we have been adopted because God's fatherhood continues on everlastingly. God was the father at the dawn of creation. He was acting as father when he sent his son for the salvation of the planet. And he continues to act as father until his son returns to earth. And he'll go on being father through all eternity, fathering us and fathering all that we minister to. And so our job is to exercise that fatherhood to broken, sad, and difficult, lonely people, including the children who have no one to father them. And so we focus in this session on the God who fathers the fatherless. Amen. amen. Thank God for his word. Amen and amen. Now, here's the discussion question for around your tables. It's just written underneath it. Why does it matter what kind of God we believe in? Now, I hinted at the answer to that early on in the teaching of a few moments ago. So around your tables, the first person should pick up this little sand timer. And when you're ready to answer it, 
flick it over, and each person have a minute to say, why does it matter all that we've talked about, about the nature of who God is?